tūtahi. Kai te mihi o āraki ki e hekurangi. Kai te mihi o kaitahu whānui ki a koutou katoa. Ki rāro o te maru o te whare nei. Nā te kōraro o te mātua ko nōm. He whare whakamahara mō rātau ko a wehi ki te pō. Koutou e pau o mā e tau o mā o te moutere nei ko i mā e koroma o te rā moutere e tika mā o i koutou katoa. Haere, haere, whai o koutou moi. Tātou o te kanui ora, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā rā koutou mo te kaupapa o te rā nei. Te kaupapa o te pūtahi taka. He tāoka hau mo tātou. He tāoka hau. Tēnā rā tātou. O kia ora no tātou, e tautoko ana au ka mihi kua kua horahia ki mui a tātou. Kia koe e te tuakana, sister, shiri, ai, ko koe, ko tātou. Nā reira e tautoko ana au te kupu o taku pāpa, arā ko tātou i ahu mai te kōpū kotahi. He mo ki te raki, ha mo ki te rangi rānei. Nā reira, nei rā tō whānau e taki tahi ana i te riro takatu i tō pāpa i te rā wiki. Ko tātou anō tērā e taki tahi ana, e hotu hotu tahi ana, nā rere te tuakana nei rā te mihi atu ki te whānau waitoa tēnā koutou. Kei tēnā hōkwe, kāna hōkwe. And that's a very good example of what we're talking about. Script. I was born into uh, to a Pākehā father uh, who was a third generation orator, a person of great depth and love of the English language and a mastery of it. His father before him was a self-educated parliamentarian, member for Westland and for Buller, and then he went on after three years of personal education to become a judge of the Supreme Court after he got kicked out of Parliament. <laughs> now, these were people who had a great love of language and it was the love of the richness of that English language heritage and the capacity for debate which it engendered has enabled me to do what I have done for Naitahu over the last uh, 52 years. Because I was the Lambton Key renter mouth. <laughs> I was the one who devised the fights and then did the scrapping. <laughs> and it's because of that heritage. My father was a particular favorite of my kaitahu toa. And he worked diligently for her causes whenever she called on him. Uh, I was... Uh, very well placed in terms of the favourite favouritism lineups, and I got a lot of attention. <laughs> and so, what I'm wanting to say is that I came from a generation that had largely lost to them, but I had one very powerful force to assist me in what I've been able to contribute, and that was a depth of language and of meaning. And that has been my weapon in my time. 
Now, Hannah can go on with her script. <laughs> so, um, Helen, you'll be pleased to know that we have a title that is on the theme that you actually requested from us. Um, and that theme, uh, that title is uh, what we're going to be talking to you about today is a Fano language journey. And that, in particular, a Fano language journey to find our voice. Now, we know that there'll be those amongst you who um, doubt the need for an O'Regan to find their voice, and those that wish more attention will be paid to an O'Regan losing it. Um, but those views aside, this isn't any voice that we want to talk to you about. Um, this is the voice that holds our traditional narratives, our cultural landscapes, and our unique identity as kaitahu, and that voice is our reo. Now, I've spoken of this deep love and respect I have for the English language, but it's something that I have shared with my, some of my key mentors, Sir James Henare, Peter Huanui, John Rangiho. These were masters of two languages, and they were able to really electrify Pākehā audiences uh, as much as they could electrify the marae. And I've always valued that thought. The most beautiful English I've ever heard spoken was spoken by a man commemorated in this building, Te Aritaua Pitama. He mightn't have had the content of those other guys, but by word, it sounded glorious. And so their quality of language and their richness was hugely important. In order to understand. Now, in order to understand the journey that our family has taken to establish a platform for intergenerational transmission of Te Reo Māori in our home environment, it's necessary to understand the historical circumstances that have led to this current context that we find ourselves in. My Māori great-grandfather, known as both Captain Charles William Bradshaw and Tarari Bradshaw, and my Māori great-grandmother, Rena Harawata or Ellen Harwood, lived in our Marae community of Awurua, or for those who come from a little farther afield, Bluff. They were both native speakers of Te Reo Māori, and it is understood by the family that they were both speakers of the Kaitahu dialect. Although their actual birth dates we're not very sure of, they were born in the 1880s, and both had died by, and they both died in the late 1940s uh, and um, mid 1950s, respectively. We're not sure of the exact point at which the language shift happened for them, whether, whether they were raised bilingually by their respective parents, my great grandparents, or whether Terrell was the only language in the home. And they learnt, certainly learnt English at school. As both sets of great-grandparents were engaged in farming and trading, it seems seasonable and reasonable to assume fluency and capacity in English as a part of, of, of their, or the ordinary language of commerce. My poa was a master mariner. He was also became not only a master mariner, but a certificated marine surveyor. He worked on the survey of the southern sub-Antarctic islands with the remarkable Captain Bollins. And so he must have had a pretty high operational use of English and relatively little opportunity for Te Reo Māori. We can assume that they had a bilingual capacity from an early age, as that was certainly the case for most kaitahu throughout our rohe by the 1880s. We also know they maintained fluency in Māori well into ad adulthood. I can recall hearing my toa speaking at length in Māori to her daughter-in-law from the uh, northern Tairoa people from uh, Katiwahiao uh, when I was just a very small child. But the other whānau around us would not have been understanding them. Although we can't pinpoint a time when they themselves transitioned from a Māori dominant language world to a bilingual one, we know they had a definite transition in terms of language in the home when they came to have their own children. 
and proceeded to use English as the language of intergenerational transmission. My Taua Renaruiha was born in 1900 and was the eldest of six children. <clears throat> Along with her five younger siblings, she was not raised in their heritage language. The most significant language shift in my family away from Te Reo therefore took place 117 years ago. This is not to say that the home environment was devoid of any reo. I recall my grandparents using common phrases and commands on a regular basis. You know, to wow. Hare atu. Sounds familiar. Hare mai koe. He kai. There's a sort of, our language as a home was splattered with that sort of te reo Māori. But, but they maintained native pronunciation in te reo, like quite a lot of our old people, particularly in Māori names and Māori place names. They, the names for their children. They sung songs in te reo and engaged in cultural activities like the traditional uh, Hoba Titi, and used a high level of Māori vocabulary in their activities. My mother spent the First World War years singing Waiata Māori with Auntie Blue Ellison around concerts to raise funds for the Pioneer Battalion overseas. So they were active in all those sorts of things, and you'd see them, there's a great photograph of a lying do you want me to do it? Elegant pose, you can do it if you like. Um, <laughs> with a kākahu kiwi and uh, looking quite the Māori songstress. But it was all the songs of Alfred Hill that she was, that she was singing. She was therefore a, remember of the, a rememberer of the language. Uh, someone who could remember different domains. She would likely have had a, a general level of receptive bilingualism insofar as being able to comprehend the gist of what, what was being said, knowing a range of commands and sayings, proverbs, terms, and being able to use these in her everyday language where appropriate. The functional ability in Tereo of her and her siblings was limited because of a lack of exposure. Thus the decline of language within our whanau continued with the passing of time, and I don't think the world she inhabited or the world she came from was any more advanced in Te Reo than she was. Taua grew up in Awarua before leaving for Wellington to train as a nurse. It was there that she met my Pākehā grandfather, Roland O'Regan, who was a house surgeon at Wellington Hospital at the time. They married and in 1931, after a decade of trying to have children, finally produced something we prepared earlier. <laughs> Um, he was born on the 23rd, this isn't in the script, but he was born on the 23rd of September in 1939 and he says that World War II was not because of him. <laughs> My father was raised in Wellington with his parents and later his two adopted siblings, Gabriel and Richard, and they were raised in the English language. But his mother continued to use her limited Māori with her son and would call him Tiwi, or the Māori transliteration for Steve. Other than the odd command or Māori words known to her, English was the dominant language of intergenerational transmission in the home. Even when I was sent down south to Bluff to stay with, my, with the whānau and my tower, English was the ordinary language of communication. There was the odd occasion where I recall people speaking Māori as a child, particularly with regard to hōku titi where you've got a whole lot of specialist words in Māori not known to other iwi, even now. And there's a whole language and culture to do with that mahinga kai of the hōputiti, which has got its own language, its own phrasing, its own meaning. In the context of a family endeavouring to revitalise the language and re-establish te reo within the family, a history of generational language loss stretching this far back poses significant challenges. In such cases, it is the very ordinary language of everyday communication which is the least accessible. In Māori, this language we often call te te reo o te kaita, the language of the kitchen, and that represents the body of lang informal language typical in familial interactions. These are the aspects of, uh, of a language that bring it to life. It embodies the humour through jokes and colloquialisms and embodies affection and emotion through terms of endearment and idioms. 
Though it's possible to learn the grammar and vocabulary of a language that has not been spoken in your family for generations, and to become functionally fluent in that language, it's much harder to become competently fluent in these informal, familial, or family interactions and contexts when you have no models of that language being shared with you and guiding your language. The guiding language maps for the new language user, detailing everything from pronunciation, the application of words in different contexts, the rules around formal and informal language, and rules for particular domains, all have to be redrawn and tested. The new learner is left not only to navigate those language maps, but to survey them themselves, and to the best of their ability, even though they're not trained in the art of survey. The reversing of language shift in our whānau sta started in the 1950s, when my father started to learn te reo Māori as a second language. The timing was right, as it coincided with the age of protest in Aotearoa that sought to raise the status of te reo in New Zealand. I got infected marching in protest marches with Norm Jews' relation, <laughs> Koro Jews. As a child, I've been guided by my Pākehā father to have a deep appreciation for history, geology, geography, place names in particular. I was also encouraged to research and explore Māori naming systems for plants, flora, fauna, particularly place names. This passion continued to grow in me as a young adult, and I continued to explore Māori history and culture, which led me to embarking on my own language acquisition journey. My father married, uh, I'm sorry, I married uh, Hannah's mother, Sandra, in 1963. <laughs> and a, a year later, we had our first daughter, Rena, was followed two years later by a second daughter, Taone. And over the next eight years, we would have three more children, Gerard, Miria, and finally, and most importantly, <laughs> and most vocally, <laughs> Hannah Merinia, who was born in 1973. Through his formal studies, my father achieved an intermediate proficiency in te reo, and before long, now as a young parent, found himself teaching Māori studies in New Zealand history as a lecturer at Wellington College of Education. His position required him to develop an ability in formal Māori language speaking so that he could uphold the cultural expectations and rituals, especially around karakia and whaikōrero. And I developed the whole business of getting bruised on the inside of my knees as I stood up on marae after marae, my knees knocking together, <laughs> and did my best to front time and again. It's an awful, painful phase to have to go through. <laughs> My Māori language world had grown, and I was being exposed to more Māori language speakers than I had during my childhood. My children were also to benefit from this increased exposure to the Māori language through association with Māori language speaking contemporaries, through participation in the uh, College of Education's Māori Cultural Club, Waiata Games, that were played there, by having the opportunity to experience numerous trips away to other marae and Māori communities in the course of the marae restoration work in which I began to become heavily engaged uh, with the artist and carver Cliff Whiting, who was himself going through much the same kind of experience. As children, we were given the opportunity to learn basic Māori songs and commands, often tikina aku hikareti, and um, Turi Turi and, okay, I won't, I won't, um, which were regularly used in the home environment. All children learned how to say an appropriate karakia for food, and although this was not something that was done at every meal, uh, it became a ritual for the main evening meal and when guests came to visit. We could count in Māori. Although we had not really tested ourselves beyond 20, um, and we knew the colours and the basic parts of the body. Our limited knowledge of the language was also helpful in family situations when something needed to be communicated in secret in the presence of others. 
even within the context of our limitations, the combination of tone and the fact that te reo Māori was being used was often enough to indicate to my father that a reaction or action was required. Make me sound so insensitive. <laughs> Scripts. In the, uh, the mid-1970s and 80s, there was limited te reo Māori in the schools that uh, the Oregon children were attending. Even with the limited proficiency, uh, they, were still likely, they were still likely to be more advanced in terms of Tyrell capability than either their teachers or the other children in the school. These opportunities helped to reinforce the language they'd acquired from home, but certainly failed to extend it. It's also worth pointing out, off script, that this one, Hannah was getting particular levels of exposure to people like Rangi Pokeha, Tarangi Ho, Sophie Carr, and others, and the other ones who were focusing on her as the, uh, as the Portiki. And that association was starting to give her an ease with the sound of the language. And I think that was hugely important. But only the last three of the five children had the opportunity to study Te Reo at secondary school, and two of them went on to sit national examinations in Te Reo. As the youngest of the five, Hannah was lucky enough to have been born in the time when the language revolution was taking place in New Zealand in the mid-1970s. It was a hugely important time, and we were the beneficiaries of it. This meant that I was literally able to ride the wave of increased awareness around the value of the language, increased pressure to make the language available to more people, and increased opportunity to be exposed to the language in mainstream society. When starting at Māori boarding school at the age of 13, I had based my assessment of my proficiency in Te on the environments that I had historically engaged in, which had largely been English-dominant language environments. Because my reo had usually been more advanced than those around me, I had an inflated view about my own ability. Not too inflated, though, I'm sure. <laughs> this was quickly dispelled when she found herself amongst a group of other 13-year-old girls at Queen Victoria College, some of, which had, some of whom had come from Maori language-speaking homes and could actually speak in whole sentences. <laughs> which is something quite foreign to her. Um, up until that point, uh, she never measured her fluency in Te Reo against her fluency in English. When I started my secondary schooling, my ability in the Māori language was actually severely limited to a beginning second language learner. Um, I came down to earth pretty quickly. I had also become acutely aware of some of the negative stereotypes or the way that kaitahu was perceived by those around me in the north. As, as those negative stereotypes were um, being associated with a kaitahu identification, they were becoming increasingly vocalised within the context of the wider Māori political movements of that time. This is in the mid-1980s. And that was largely, a certain amount of that went to her personally, not just to kaitahu, because I was becoming a significant troublemaker within the New Zealand environment, all sorts of people, Māori were getting very embarrassed against about other Māori that were upsetting the power culture. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Hana was perhaps the fairest of all the girls at the school in a city that was the furthest away from my Kaitahu tribal territory than any other Māori boarding school, living with a group of girls who had very little knowledge about the South Island or Kaitahu. Thanks, Dad. After two years at high school, I decided that I would commit to doing something about those stereotypes. I believed that I could change and influence these, and that I would do everything to help my people find their voice again in Māori language. I saw clearly how proficiency in te reo Māori could establish, or could help establish, credibility of a person's identity in Māoridom, and I wanted that for kaitahu. After four years of tuition and formal classroom bilingual language learning environment, I'd achieved about an intermediate level of language competency. Her undergraduate years saw her move through to an intermediate to advanced 
band of language proficiency, by which time she had enough language to enable her to engage with Māori language scripts across multiple genres, from creative writing to political narratives, 19th century Māori newspapers when she finally started making a few bucks to subsidise the huge expenditure of the parents, <laughs> to modern, right through to modern Māori education publications and also have a medium level of comprehension in Māori language immersion environments. These skills are enough to secure her a lecturing position in the Māori language at Otago University at the age of 21. Over the next six years, her language will continue to develop as a language teacher of adults and therefore developing greater understanding about language structure and patterns of use, as well as a greater exposure to her own Kaitahu dialect and its examples. By 1996, 10 years since first engaging in formal language learning, I'd moved to, through to about a medium to advanced stage with the caveat that the proficiency in the language was still largely limited to the domains that I had become familiar with and those were domains outside of the home environment. Therefore, I had very limited capacity to support intergenerational transmission in the minority heritage language in the home. Despite my years of engaging in te reo, despite my lecturing position, all of those things, I had never, for a sustained period, had to talk with children in te reo. Therefore, I had a limited knowledge of what was the appropriate language, what, I might, what the vocabulary was that I might be expected to use, and how to engage with tamariki. And when I considered the broader set of domains, as you can see up here, of families across those different age groups, from babies, young children, teenagers, and so forth, I found myself even further out of my comfort zone. These kinds of language examples, not, not surprisingly, were really introduced into the formal language classroom. In 2003, my eldest child, Manu Haya, uh, Manuhaya Rina Mamaru Oregon was born and her brother followed a year later um, in 2004. I had committed to establishing a Māori language home environment for my children. Their father was not a speaker of Māori, therefore uh, was reliant on English as a medium of communication with his children. As I committed to only speaking Māori, we had knowing, unknowingly adopted the one parent, one language strategy for raising bilingual children. This diagram presents uh, the familial relationship languages of my children, where I maintained a Māori language only environment to them. I spoke English to their older brothers, English to their father, their father spoke English to everybody, so we had this little circle of a Māori language world within the home environment. In order to support their language development, I had to be planned and deliberate. These are two key words, planned and deliberate about their language exposure to know firstly what might be the language expectations of those around the tamariki that I could realistically set. I then needed to identify who I could conscript, if we'd want to use a military term, who I could conscript it's into a political our... term, done by the settler state on innocent Māori troops, we know about it. Who I could um, conscript into our family language mission and clearly set the language relationship goals. Uh, before my daughter was born, I actually sat around having these conversations and I gave roles to everybody within the family. Some chose to listen. Others said that it was their idea in the first place. Um, so you can see here I had a number of different family members and, uh, and identified what the expectations were. When Manuhaya was born, I actually held a meeting and hold, told my family I wanted to raise her in te reo and explained why it was so important to be deliberate. I assigned those roles and asked them to support me in setting these expectations. I found her Māori language aunts and uncles and cousins, I saw Te Altahi here earlier today, and asked them to commit whenever, wherever, whenever possible and wherever they were to only speaking Māori uh, to my daughter. Both Manuhaya and Tero Tafri attended a bilingual early learning centre from six months of age. But there are only a few other children at the centre who are fluent in Māori and who are being raised in Māori at home. From three and a half years of age, Manuhaya started Kohanga Reo for two days a week and Te Tafri started six months later at age three. I was acutely aware of the balance of language engagement of my children, or rather the imbalance, 
in the home and the impact that this was likely to have on their own language development, as well as the likelihood of any future use and retention of te reo. This was something that was in the forefront of my thinking on a daily basis. Despite the challenges of English language dominance all around, the strategy of establishing te reo as the relationship language between the maternal parent and the two children themselves was successful insofar as it remained resilient until the eldest Manuhaya started primary school. It was at that point that she started to use more English in communication with her brother, especially if Hannah was not around, or if they didn't realize that I was around. Yeah. And one of my most precious memories, memories is lying in bed uh, uh, with my wife and, is this and the, two, show? The, the, two, the two, by this stage of marriage, no, okay, yes. That's, that's okay. <laughs> And the, um, and the two little ones were in, in bed with us. And they were rattling away to each other in Māori and rattling away and having a conversation with me in Māori. They were very, very tiny and it was about my level of te reo. But we were having great fun talking about it and then I'd be asked a question. And of course, very quickly, my grossly inadequate grammar was uh, found out and discoverable my capacity uh, for metaphor, which I was translating out of English into Māori, would have been lost on them. And so I was floundering about, and Manuhaya hauled off and said, E poa, ho <laughs> Even my wife knew I was being told off. <laughs> and of course, I sh desperately upset her, because all I could do is just, just about roll out of bed hysterical with laughter being told off in this way and she didn't appreciate that at all. She was dead serious about my inadequacies. Perhaps one of the greatest challenges of encouraging tribal members to commit to raising bilingual children in Te Reo lies in the sheer size of the task itself. Even with all of the passion, resolve and commitment to take on the challenge, there's no denying the day-to-day -day pressures that are experienced by parents committed to intergenerational transmission of a minority language in the home. Just as is the case when we need to clear the decks to embark on a new journey, so too for the language voyager, there comes a point when the challenges on the horizon just need to be tackled head on. That is when strategy comes into play. For our whānau, the strategies that we have used include the establishment of a family language plan where key speakers are requested to maintain Māori-only relationships, the deliberate and consistent exposure to a wide range of native speaker of language examples, deliberate, again, deliberate, you'll see this deliberate coming through the whole way, the deliberate facilitation of language communities and groups where other examples of intergenerational transmission were experienced, active engagement in bilingual and immersion education settings, maintaining a variety of Māori language domains outside the home, keeping it spicy, keeping it active, keeping it fun, actively teaching language genre that support the development of creative language uh, expression, whakatauki, kiwaha, that normal language, te reo o te kaita, and providing rich language experiences for the children to develop their cognitive abilities in both Māori and English. At 12 and 13 years of age, these two children are now completely bilingual. Whilst Hannah maintains a broader knowledge of vocabulary and grammar in Terrell, if not in content, this will be expected of any adult-child relationship and does not detract from the level of proficiency that might be expected of a native speaker in any language at their age. The current proficiency in Terrell is greater than her own proficiency when I started lecturing. When she started lecturing. When she started lecturing um, in language at the University of Otago at age 21. My children have a wider range of grammatical structures at their disposal than I did at that stage, and I feel sorry for the students I taught when I was at university. Um, and they also engage more confidently than I did across a much wider range of language domains. They are also confident speakers of English. Um, and as I heard yesterday, their ability to use interesting aspects of the English language have also developed um, over time. 
Uh, as their metalinguistic skills have continued to be developed through their English language interactions. I assure you I could teach them something in those extra schools from my days at sea. I've told them they're allowed to swear in Māori, but the swear jar is for English. Although it is still true that the quality of their language would have likely been more enhanced if Hana had been a native speaker of Te Reo, what they have had transmitted to them has allowed for a positive language development, coupled with a strong cultural identity and a sense of connection to their heritage, language and culture. Any negative cost of having a second language speaker as a transmitter of the first language could therefore be argued to be an acceptable one, given the other cultural and identity benefits received, and the overall positive cognitive development of the children. On reflection, when looking at the generational rate of change shift reversal in my family, it's easy to understand why it is purported to take at least three generations to bring a language back to life. While there are branches in the family tree that have metaphorically fruited, there are still others that are yet to blossom. And even that is assuming that there will exist the desire or inclination to pursue the language at all. It's absolutely essential that you've got something Māori to talk about. If you're not functioning in that world, it makes te reo a, a nonsense. What is positive, however, is that there has been an element of linguistic persistence, albeit within the language represented at a basic proficiency level, from the grandfather to all of his grandchildren. Even though my father was at an intermediate level when he had his children, he did not use all the language he knew with his children, imparting only the language at an introductory level. However, all of my siblings have managed to impart that minimum to their children, along with a positive appreciation of the language. The real test will be seen in the proficiency of the next generation. The hope is that as long as they continue to develop and strengthen their Māori language proficiency, then when they have their own children, the language of intergenerational transmission will be of a significantly higher quality than what they themselves received and fewer compromises should have to be made. Again with the proviso, they need something Māori to talk about. The emotional investment in successful intergenerational language transmission may be argued to be greater when the language that is being transmitted is endangered, on account of the fact there is much more to lose. This can create a significant burden for those engaged in language revitalization. And despite being aware of positive child-rearing practices, this pressure may be imposed on the younger children who, in the hope for the language survival, is placed. I coin the, coin the term here, the intergenerational transmission of guilt. My father's actually an expert at that, but let me give you a few examples myself. There have been times when those of us who have been engaged with the Kotahi Mano Kaika strategy, that's our, that's our Kaitahu language strategy, that times that we have tried to use the guilt card with the wider Kaitahu iwi as a way of pressuring them into action from a position of apathy around language uh, to a position of action. And we've used messages like... There may never be another opportunity to save our language. <laughs> do not do something... To, to not do something about your language now will mean your grandchildren may never have the option to learn it. If you fail to take the necessary steps now... <laughs> you know how to do that. <laughs> Where did you learn? If you fail to take the necessary steps now, you need to be ready to tell your grandchildren why you did nothing when you had the chance and agreed to let the language die. Now, I am personally guilty of delivering such emotionally charged rhetoric on various occasions in the last 20 and years. And not just to the children. <laughs> right. So it's another challenge, however, when we turn to discussing the raising of our bilingual children and how you actually apply that guilt strategy in the home environment to ensure that the minority language is used in the family domain. The pressure of being an active party to dialectual death is transmitted to the children. Dialectical. Dialectical death is transmitted to the children. Such, I think they knew what I was speaking about. Such events in a mother's memory are not often found in the pool of her proudest moments. 
On the contrary, I feel an, t an intense mix of shame and guilt and anxiety when I reflect on the measure to which I have done this. I'm at the same time often conflicted, though, with the feelings of desperation and empathy for the emotion. Even though I know the behaviour would not be upheld as a positive one, I can recall not knowing what else to do when hearing the children leave Te Reo Māori and go into English and speak with each other to, in English when we know that they're able to speak in Māori. The tiring role of being the language police and repeating the same encouraging phrases to the user language over and over again that are delivered in less and less encouraging tones throughout the day as they move into more scolding expressions is simply tiring. It seems comparatively easy in such contexts to slip into one's lower self and spurt out threats and guilt trips to one's children like if you don't speak our language, our language will die. You are killing our dialects. You are killing our language by not speaking it. So, as mentioned, I'm not necessarily saying I'm proud of those moments. Um, and the pressure that I put on my young children, or indeed suggesting that any one of those strategies actually works, Instead, I recall the events as a way of highlighting the position that I found myself in as a mother desperately trying to maintain an endangered language, knowing that it hadn't been spoken for 117 years. Perhaps the most dramatic example of this burden that I've placed on my children can be illustrated by the interactions I had with them during one of the most traumatic events of their lives and our lives, which is our Christchurch earthquakes. For any parent who finds themselves in the throes of a natural or a man-made disaster, you may find yourself acting in a way you might not normally expect to act. There were two significant aspects of our interactions that I'm going to quickly, at ADHD speed, um, reflect on. Living at the beach, my first thought when the first big 7.2 earthquake struck in September in 2014, 2010 sorry, was about the threat of a tsunami. I had prepared for the event. My emergency tsunami pack was at the ready and I just wanted the house to stop shaking violently so I could fetch it and get the kids' life jackets. My children, then aged seven and eight, had different ideas. While sheltering under the door frame in the bathroom, my son repeatedly asked me to pray to Duomoko, God of Earthquakes. This was, of course, the last thing on my mind <laughs> and certainly not my priority as it did not bring the tsunami pack any closer. He was insistent, crying and pulling on my top, pleading me to me to pray to Duomoko, who in Māori belief is obviously the unborn child trapped in the stomach of Papa Tuanuku. Having grown up with English as my first language and learnt about the Māori gods in much the same way I'd learnt about the Greek gods, I was for, far more concerned with my Western science understanding of earthquakes <laughs> and the possibility of a tsunami than I was about their Māori worldview. For my children, however, their Māori worldview was the only worldview. So I decided a wash with emotion and a sense of fate given the size of the earthquake that if a tsunami was to occur, we didn't stand a chance. So I decided the very least I could do was to attempt to calm them and do as they are. So I held them close and I, we prayed to Duomoko. Although I knew earthquakes only last for a certain period of time, they didn't. So in my son's mind, it worked. <laughs> Their language, their, language was their language was intrinsic to them and they both sought comfort from it. Within minutes of the first major earthquake, the aftershocks were coming fast, uh, thick and fast. It was still pitch black and my attention turned to getting torches so we had some light. I put the children in my bed with my, um, with my whakai daughter, Rere Moana, who was 18, and I went, don't ask where the father was, I went um, to go and try and find some torches. But my departure was met by howls from my son, who, as I attempted to reassure him, started crying to me, Mama, e mōhio ano hea hai pene ai. That's you. Okay, I'll say it. Mama, I know why this has happened. My reaction was to ask him to be brave so I could go and get the torches, but he was persistent. Kao mama, e mōhio tonu au hea hai pene ai. No, Mama, I know why this has happened. I replied, replied by saying to him that I did not understand what he was trying to say. And then he sobbed and spurted out, um, No, Mama, it's my fault. Manuhaya and I have been speaking in English. For <laughs> it 
it struck me at that moment that my children believed that the single most terrifying event that they had ever experienced could have been the result of them speaking English to each other instead of te reo Māori. My immediate response was to comfort my sobbing, sobbing child by reassuring him that it had nothing to do with him and that he had not caused the earthquake to happen. But even at that moment, even at that moment, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> so I said to him, Baby, e hara i ako e te tau, e hara i te mea nāhau tēnei āhua taka, e kari he tika tō whakāro me koro Māori kōro o tia kōroa. No, it's not because of you, honey. It's not because of anything you've done, but you are right in your thinking. You two should be speaking Māori to each other. <laughs> and that was before I got the torches. Even at that most desperate time, it was obvious that the burden of guilt at not having maintained a Māori-only conversation with his sister was making my son believe that he had caused the earthquake. I still was not able to simply reassure him. Instead, I had to go that extra little, extra little um, way and reiterate my desire for them to only speak Māori to each other. I'm not attempting by sharing my lower self moments to present my response as a positive strategy for raising bilingual children. The counselling bills will probably mount up later on. I am no, by, by no means proud of this personal behaviour, but it does serve the purpose of highlighting the power that the language can have in the context of a relationship and the expectations around engagement between parents and children in the context such as ours. To return to the uh, strategic Fano approach. Um, actually, I think we might just even... Well, very in summary, when, when we looked at our Fano approach, right from the beginning, we planned how we were going to manage the language within our, within our fam and family and within the generations. We constructed our language family, and we did it in a way that tried as much as possible to ensure that there was fun, there was community, there was support, there was love, there was understanding, and there was connection. The mentor approach proved successful as well. When later questions around the quality of the children's English language were asked, um, we, were. we were able to reinforce the role of the mentor to actively look for strat strategies to address it, thereby ensuring that the Māori-only language relationship could be maintained. Um, right. After 14 years of implementing our own family language plan, we were able to present examples of intergenerational transmission that have been successful in other strategies that, with the benefit of hindsight, were not so successful. Importantly, we are able to provide an example within the kaitahu context of intergenerational language shift being able to be achieved whereby for the first time in five generations, over 120 years after the last native speakers were born in our family, we can re-establish a generation of native speakers of Te Reo. We can see the example of a native speaking grandfather there, again with a pipe in his mouth, but a native speaking grandfather, Tare Bradshaw, shifting away from Te Reo as the intergenerational language of transmission with his grandson sitting on his knee, that's my father, and then how a couple of generations later, that same grandson, Tipani Regan, can learn the language in adulthood and make the commitment to speak to his own grandson, Te Reo Tawhiri, uh, only in Te Reo. All right, acknowledging the sheer amount of time involved in reintroducing a language back into a family or community is an important lesson to help people make realistic plans about their revitalization journey. The second lesson learnt is the need to be planned and deliberate in your language acquisition and revitalisation. An essential element of this is understanding and planning for the type of language you need to be learning and using and targeting your energies accordingly. Simply put, if your goal is the reintroduction of intergenerational language into the home, then you need to be learning and using relevant intergenerational language. And again, You've got to have content, Māori content, to talk about. It took one generation, my Tawas generation, to lose the language and three generations to get it back. It will be two generations later that the first small steps, 
made by my father to reverse language shift would start to occur within our family and modeling a commitment and love for the language as a second language speaker. It was then one more generation before the language would be learned to a level, to a higher level, and that commitment and love for the real extended to become the language of love and transmission in the home for our children. Our family is now in our third generation of language acquisition and first generation of intergenerational transmission. The reality for us is that it will likely be another generation at least on the provision that my children continue to develop and extend their language depth and breadth and raise their children into real before we will, we, we will be able to be in a position where we can say we've got it back. What will be helpful for them to achieve that goal will be an understanding of the lessons we've learned and those that have been learned by others along the language revitalization highway. Knowing the route taken by preceding generations will help them understand the map ahead of them. What roads are likely to be dead ends, what roads are navigable, and what shortcuts can be taken to help get them to their destination quicker and in good health and good spirits. The final lesson to share is the importance of my children and their counterparts knowing that they have to be in the driving seat. They have to drive their language development themselves and do do so with as much commitment and planning as the previous generation. If they were to leave it on autopilot or for someone else to drive, then history and, and international experience shows us that as a minority indigenous language, it is unlikely to survive and prevail by itself. Each generation must reset their GPS and plan their route. Each generation may, must use the language and commit to it. Failure to do so will simply take us back to the beginning of Fishman's Whakatawaki. It takes one generation to lose a language, and the Fano will be taken back 116 years to 1900 to start the journey again. Kotene te kōrero o te Fano mō tēne tāoka paunamu mō tātou o te reo. Hei kōrero o te whakāri o te reo. He kōrero rō, he kōrero nā te tino kaha o te tamahine ne, taku pōtiki. He kari, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou, āraki matatū. Tō tū te titi, tau tahi te au. Thank you.